Thank you for having uh, us for a discuss with you. My name is uh, Henrik Tudor, and this is uh, Asmat Banki. We come from the Danish internet political think tank, and uh, uh, it's called Bitbull, or the Big Agency. And we'd like to talk about our experiences trying to bootstrap uh, internet political discourse in Denmark. So, what is the Bit Bureau? It's, on the one hand, it's a think tank for internet politics. Um, that's how we started, at least, that it should be <coughs> provide analysis, um, courses, education, um, do projects like business projects, and consulting for business. And then also it should be a civil society organization, an NGO or NGO, um, doing activism, um, involving itself in public debate, and uh, engaging with the civil society at large, and doing lobbyism, actually talking to politicians directly. On a more uh, personal level, one of the reasons that we started the bit here two years ago was that we actually felt pretty excluded from participating in the debates about the future of the internet and internet policy in Denmark. And uh, we didn't have any access ticket to participate in any of the discussions that were happening in Denmark because it was either you had to be like a big company or you had to be a government entity or a um, scholar working in academia to get your voice heard. So we had to pretty much figure out how to to change that. And uh, we decided that uh, becoming a think, think tank would be like a, a good hack for um, getting like a legitimate position in the public discourse. And um, yeah, it actually worked out. People started listening to us and treat us as experts. And, and a little bit about the background is that uh, most of us have some kind of background in some kind of copyright debate. Like one guy who used to be in what is called the Pirate Group, the Pirate Bureau. One I was doing uh, volunteering for Creative Commons. People were doing activist work in, in uh, the IT community. There was a lot of different forces going together. So we have some very hackery technical types and some very academic non-technical types as well. So it's it's like a mix of, of different saying that, okay, we want to do this, we want to actually do something new in, in Danish politics. So in the beginning, we, need, we needed a manifesto, we needed something like, what, what does this organization stand for? And we were like, hmm, yeah, we want a free internet, but what does that mean? So we started looking like, what kind of other organizations do the same kind of work as we want to do? And we were looking to Sweden, looking at telecomics, we were looking at uh, the EFF in uh, the United States, and we were saying, okay, we can't, we can't bootstrap an electronic frontier foundation for Denmark. That's not going to happen. Um, and we can't bootstrap an uh, underground hacker network like Telecomics just from the ground up. But we can do something like in between. So we took basically just the, we needed we needed a manifesto. So what we did was, what, what does the free internet mean to us? So basically we just stole the EFF, like five points. What, what does it mean? Um, we needed something to, to, to put on our webpage. And then we just started networking with people that we that we thought would be interested in working um, along these five points. Uh, yeah, and another tactic would be used was uh, we started to correct journalists. Like, oh, this is an interesting error-prone article you've written about Anonymous or uh, WikiLeaks. Um, there are some factual errors, and we are actually expert in these kind of matters. <laughs> <laughs> Well, a second opinion for so your next ask you can come and ask us. And that uh, actually worked out uh, pretty well. So before the Bit Bureau, there were actually organizations working for internet freedom in their own ways. Um, and there were some organizations working against internet freedom. Um, so on the, on, the good, on the good side, there was a, a, there's a, a thing called Politisk for Ening, they were doing a lot of work and a lot of um, analysis actually, a lot of, of stuff around the stuff that we wanted to do. Our criticism of them was that they were doing it like in their, um, within their organization, they were, and they were, they were not doing it like out into the public, in the media and so on. So we really wanted to be sort of not as much a discussion club, but a PR bureau for internet freedom. We wanted to produce something, like produce public discourse about it. Um, there's POSA, which is a, an IT union doing, um, yeah, like union, unionizing people working in IT. 
um, that the, the Warhol, which is a, a consumer rights organization, very um, legitimate, very ordered, very boring, very, um, I mean, their, their take on internet freedom is just how to protect consumers' rights. And it's not, it's like a soft field of what they do. But they're doing good work too. And then there's the telecommunications industry that are also lobbying for sort of internet, internet freedom, but only if it costs them money, they don't want to implement like new policies like um, data retention and DNS blocking and so on. So there's, they're kind of fighting the, the, the fight, but it's, it's not ideological. Really. And then there's like all the internet people, like all the people that we wanted to connect together in some kind of organization or some kind of, of uh, structure. And then on the other side, internet politics, like um, um, formerly it's been mostly the anti-piracy um, organizations that have been vocal and, and actually changing policy in Denmark. So we have DNS blocking of the Pirate Bay, for example. That was uh, the, the, just the fact that it, could, it was possible was because you had lawyers, you had, you had basically a swing door between the rights industry and the Ministry of Culture in Denmark. It's the same people that produced the law that made it possible to actually legally DNS block the pirate thing. It's the same same guy that actually wrote the legislation as a, um, like a, a public official that later became the lawyer that was, was actually taking the case against the, 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 the telephone company, internet service provider that actually produced the, 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 the nationwide DNS block of, of uh, the pirate um, Then we have the police that are agitate for data retention even though they they have no there's no evidence that they actually use any of the internet um, data logging for um, for for investigative purposes they still lobby for oh, we need we might need it someday right um, then there's the telecommunications industry again they actually went along with the DNS blocking they, they actually didn't fight all the way to to uh, to, uh, to to get rid of it. And then there's clueless politicians, clueless journalists. Like we said, we provide, we're not going after the persons, like the, the politicians themselves, we're going after the cluelessness. We want to talk to them to actually make them aware that there is a, there, I mean, they, they, they can actually be corrected in a way that they can produce good policy. And the journalists can be pro corrected in a way that they can produce more um, correct articles about how the internet works. <laughs> so. Yeah, and the uh, well, cluelessness can be like a vague term, but uh, it works in this way that there are pretty much different views on what the internet are. If you're a company, it's like a platform for your services. If you're a police official, it's a surveillance uh, tool you can use in your investigation. And what we actually lack from the politician and the journalist is to have like a critical view that the internet can be more like a service platform, or more like a registration tool for law enforcement. And actually, maybe can be like a tool for uh, yeah, civic uh, purposes, for example. Yes. Um, one of the reasons that we didn't join in on some of the existing internet political groups in Denmark, Denmark was trying to avoid some of the anti patterns of traditional organizing. Like, um, what we experienced was that a lot of groups had this divide between members and the doers, the people who are formally a part of the organization and the, the people who are allowed to speak and decide policy and act and do stuff. And we pretty much wanted to not fall in that trap and try to be more open. So um, we talked about all kind of uh, so to try to have really much try to hard to develop new principles of organizing, and um, try to see if we could um, not as much be an organization that um, uh, subsumes all kinds of uh, activities uh, around us, but uh, try to be like uh, a connection point between existing actors and ourselves. <coughs> So in the beginning, I mean, most I guess most people have read uh, Clay Shirky's "Here Comes Everybody," the uh, like the, the power of organizing without organization. So we we said, okay, we don't need an organization. We need to organize, um, and that meant more connecting with people than actually building some formal structure that people that people could participate in. 
Um, and also, we did. We don't want the bid bureau to be as big as possible and as powerful, but we just wanted to be as influential as possible. And that actually meant for us remaining quite small, so we can can be nimble and interact and actually be be able to to follow up on, on the agenda like pretty quickly in a, or instead of having to go all the way to the top and down to the bottom like a like a traditional organization. That meant that we wanted to to be copyable. We want people to do the same kind of organization, like a new new big bureau, a new think tank, in order to I mean the more people that are doing the same thing, the more power it has. Um, so we try to do everything as open source as possible. We try to borrow as much as possible from every other organization that works in the same kind of way. And then we want it to be combinable. We don't want to have party politics. We don't want Okay, so we're in bit, the bid bureau, and we are against uh, the way that, for example, Prosa or the IT political organization works. It's like we can combine with them, with them on a lot of different points. Also, with the political parties, we can go to the very left wing of, of like the Red Green Alliance in Denmark and say, you have, you have some good points in your policy, and, and maybe you should think about this. And we can go to the, like the Liberal uh, Alliance, the, the ultra liberalists, and we've been talking even with the nationalists. I mean, some the, we, we're not trying to be a party political and you know, the left right, we, we just want to focus on internet policy, um, policy and then not be a, a party about it, like, like the, the uh, party party, for example. And then in the end, we wanted to scale, but we don't want it to scale as the organization, we wanted to scale as the discourse. So that we can plug into all these other organizations, and if we disagree on something, we can unplug that. But we don't have to completely destroy the infrastructure. Yeah. yeah. So still, this is on this slide it's been on the abstract level, and the, so, but our experiences with it should become more concrete when we get to talk about how we have the actor campaign in Denmark. And actually, one of the one of the purposes of Thinking in combinability, for example, instead of uh, monolithic organizations, is uh, to handle the uh, disagreements in a productive way, just like uh, Gabriella was uh, talking a bit about yesterday. And uh, we experienced that the, the IT political discourse in parties were much about winning the party line internally, much more than about influencing uh, real policies uh, in the government and institutions. So they spent a lot of energy in fighting each other for having the uh, really, really right and pure view or the, the specific view on how a policy should be. And um, we try to actually not make uh, organizations where it's possible to have this kind of fight over uh, who gets the monopoly on the, on the criticism or the idea of the party line. Uh, and, uh, one of the reasons is to try to handle disagreements in a productive manner where it's possible to be disagreeing on some details in, for example, uh, politics about uh, net neutrality or data retention, but uh, trying to disregard that and collaborate on the places where we can agree with other actors. So yeah, as, as we said, we're not trying to build an organization, we're trying to make an interface that makes it possible to make uh, internet politics a, a public discourse. Something that it's not only the geeks and the, 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 the techies that are uh, talking about that, it's something that's involving everyone in the society. But, and that means talking to journalists and talking to politicians. Um, so we really, really want it to be an interface between like internet activists and the more you know, um, formal political system an interface between the internet society, like what's going on here at FSCons, and then civil society organizations like consumer rights organizations, or um, yeah, political parties and unions and so on. And then just the internet and traditional media. Just that interface is completely, I mean, there's so many many articles in Danish, Danish newspapers that are just horribly wrong <laughs> that we try to, you know, do, do our best to actually connect it with, just connect them with sources that make more sense than some social media expert, for example, or consultant in an IT firm, something like that. And then we want to connect like the hypocrisy, like ourselves, and the hierarchies, for example, as on the more abstract level, saying like a political party works in a certain way, but it has to somehow be able to talk to what's going on, like networked on the ground in the more like the somatic form, um, 
that forms of organization. And yeah, the model is just a really good picture of like how we think. It's like when we talk to politicians, I mean, we don't put on suits, but it would be a good idea to put on a suit, shave, and go in the lobby, but you know that behind you have all the weird, geeky coders and activists that are, that you're actually talking on behalf of them or actually giving them a voice in the political system. Uh, okay. So it also, it also involves a lot of practical technical stuff. So we run, uh, we run a server, a server trying to, to build an infrastructure for activists. And that was one of the things we were really thinking about how to, yeah, if we want to be a different kind of organization, how should we enact that? And one of the principles that we pretty much quickly adopted was to uh, have the platform that enable us to do our work should be open for others as well as ourselves. So uh, um, we use uh, Etherpads, mail lists, uh, Tor, uh, we have great campaign sites and we do like you create communication tools like every other open source software project and uh, these tools that we use ourselves and we host on our servers are publicly accessible to others or semi-publicly <laughs> accessible to others who ask um, and yeah the reason for doing that is that uh, it's what we want to contribute to uh, others in the Danish uh, IT political and activist scene are the tools that make our own association possible. And uh, yeah, that's been working quite well. So the, the PAD and the mail list uh, are communication tools for other groups doing similar activities, but where we are the enabling platform. And um, when we when it comes to the active campaign, some of the tools we found really useful was the tool provided by, for example, like the to the net with the political memory platform, where it can track uh, both Voting in the parliament and stuff like that. So we really think that there is a, a well, not a future, but a, there is a really strong uh, incentive for trying to create open infrastructures for each other that we can use by. And then there's the, just the fact that there are actually, we're not alone, there are uh, other organizations doing the same thing as us in, yeah, in France, for example, as La Quattro or Digitale Gesellschaft. There's a lot of these organizations that sort of do the same thing in an open fashion and we can borrow from them and we make our own stuff available to them. And what we think also is an infrastructure is just having the name, the Beat Bureau, in the public discourse. It means that journalists actually call us in order to ask us about. So what do you think about this whole anonymous thing? Or what do you think of data retention? And, and just having a brand in the public discourse is an infrastructure in itself. And we haven't really discussed that much how open that brand is. At the moment, it's actually quite close. We have five people that are the collective that is, is actually <coughs> using the brand as spokespeople. But we have a lot of, how do you say, like um, undergrowth of people that are part of the part of the, the, the discourse behind people. That so we we want in, in the best thing would be that if that everyone could put on the bit we have like anonymous like put on the anonymous mask and then you spoke for anonymous. But that wouldn't really work in order to have continuity. So that's something that we're always discussing, like how open is the, the brand. So actually, we're not going to talk about the trees because it's, it got voted down. But we're going to talk about what we did in order to help it, um, help it fall. So um, yeah, actually, it was a horrible process. It was a horrible product. And it's a horrible a part of a horrible project, too. But it's, uh, Oh, one thing that we learned from it is that it's, it produced a really, really interesting way of protesting um, that was completely decentralized and uh, autocratic, and it actually succeeded in the end. Our first, what we did like as the first move when Den Denmark uh, had signed ACTA, it signed ACTA on the 26th of January, and uh, that weekend, the, it was on the Thursday, and the weekend after we had a, a a crypto workshop, teaching like a three-day weekend workshop of teaching PDP and TrueCrypt and like all these, like a, a proto crypto party. And um, in the evening we were like, we need to do something about this actor thing, but what can we actually do that's effective? So we sat down and said, we started just brainstorming, coding a site that 
was explaining what's wrong with ACTA, what's, what can you do, call the politician, basically taking everything that La Quadrature had done on the ACTA wiki and then just making it iPad friendly. And I'd actually like to, to just, uh, uh, just show it like visually what I mean when I say iPad friendly. It's, uh, it's a nice useful site so you can, you can uh, click it and you know, it's like blinking lights kind of design. And uh, then you have the, the politicians that would vote for it and you can press this button and a puffs um, his telephone number and uh, a quote what he says and then you have uh, like a small explanation like call him and be, be polite and so on and then a little role play and all this is copied it's all the like, two stuff that we that we um, that we uh, translated so it's not really original so what happened was I guess I see just in the process um, just a second So to ex the, the, the copyability was, I mean, we did the site and it, it exploded. It, it went all over the place and during, during, like we released it on Sunday and on the Monday it was spread all over Facebook, all over Twitter and people started actually calling. And um, then some um, German guys from Digital Gesellschaft asked, can we have the source code? Because we have more parliamentarians than you. And they were like, uh, of course you can. So, um, they basically did the, whole, the exact same site for their 99, um, 99 parliamentarians, and then some Dutch people did the same thing. Now it's, now it's of course the winning site, not the, the, the call your representative, but I mean, same thing, just in Dutch. So that's, that's just an illustration of like what, what, um, what copyability actually means for us. It's, should be as easy as possible for people to act and and uh, and work work uh, on on the same same um, same project. What happened actually? The first thing that happened on the Monday was that the Jens Rode, who's an MEP from Denmark, he uh, released a press re release through the Danish Liberal Party's press service saying you have to close down that site because my phone is not it. And of course that got 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 into the news and that was a news story and. Uh, of course, we put him in the in the in the in the um, in the category that he would vote for ACTA because he probably would if if you look at his voting record like up to up to then. And then he was like, "We haven't decided yet." So we were okay. We we're going to put you in undecided instead of <laughs> voting for. So that I mean that produced a lot of news stories that drove a lot of more traffic to the site, and that just basically um, made the whole thing go even faster. And it looked like it actually scared the shit out of some of the Danish MEPs actually to be contacted by some of their constituents. Uh, they lived a really quiet life down in Brussels, so when their phone started ringing, they were like, oh shit, this is a total new uh, situation, I haven't even tried this before. And uh, when the Danish liberal started to whine about it, his constituents actually wanted to talk to him in the media, then uh, all the journalists were like, hey, that's your civic duty, and uh, that was, that was really nice. Uh, weird yeah, drama going on that uh, actually kick-started the whole attention on the, the actor uh, issue. So yeah, it wasn't just us that were against actor, there was also the other organizations like uh, the IT Political Association, POSA, Occupy Denmark got into the mix also, um, and then for Facebook, Kids, I'm calling them. Four guys from a faraway city. Um, they did a Facebook event saying, "Oh, hey, we want a demonstration against ACTA, and it's going to be in a month, and it's going to be in Copenhagen, right there." And people just started attending. So there were maybe four four different Facebook events in the beginning, like different demonstrations on different days. But one just started taking off, and that was like, "Okay, we're going to focus on that." It has like a two, a thousand or two thousand attendees, like after a couple of days. So let's just push that and see what happens. Um, so we actually it started out that we, we made an umbrella organization called Stop Actor Denmark and created a website stopactor.nu and then we had one meeting in like meet space, maybe 35 people from all these organizations saying, okay, what how can we organize this? Because we didn't want to do the whole you know pyramid action again. 
Um, so we said, okay, some guys do analysis, like the IT political union, they're very good at going into the text and picking pick apart and explaining that exactly what is wrong with that in, in a way that politicians and their, their public officials can understand. Um, we said, okay, we know how the media, um, we, uh, we don't, but we said, we know how the media works, so we'll be the public spokespeople for the stop acting movement. So I, I got the role as, as like the, the guy that, that when you called this number, it was, it was, um, redirected to my phone, so my phone would ring with journalists asking questions and why are you against this and what's the problem with it and so on. Every single day for the whole month from from the from the, the, the signing on, up until the demonstration. Um, so we had like three meet space events that was the, the original meeting, um, like constructing this weird umbrella organization. Then we had the demonstration a month after that was uh, incredible. And then we had a public hearing, and that was really interesting because of all this stuff going on in the media and the in, on the internet. On two Danish media organizations um, said, "Okay, we need to actually make something of a public hearing about this because there's been no transparency, no public debate." Um, so it was actually the Danish Broadcasting Corporation actually does a small program on the small talk radio station called P8. It's a program called Hard and it's one of the most longest running programs in. in all of, of Danish uh, broadcasting, they went together with a newspaper called Information and they said, okay, we're going to have a public hearing with the politicians, with the, or all the organizations that are some, somewhat critical, and there was a lot of organizations that pitched in with critics, um, like, like uh, I don't know what the English word is, like opinions. So it was the librarians organization, it was um, even like Dansk Industri, like the Danish, the biggest industrial lobby in Denmark, they pitched in um, the energy, Dansk Energi, the, the like energy providers. It was like tons of organizations, and of course the anti-piracy movement, they pitched in with a really ridiculous opinion, saying, for a safer internet, we need ACTA, and so on. Um, but that's just to say that, was, that the ball was picked up not only by activists, but also by media. Um, then we had the whole networking going on on Twitter, using a Danish hashtag, so everyone that was talking about this, the politicians, the activists, the media, could actually follow the discussion on Twitter, and it wasn't like a lot of people, it was all the people that were interested. Again, um, following this, here comes everybody, logic that if you participate participating, you're part of the process, right? And we found out a good, uh, really good strategy for using Twitter in a protest situation is that if you find people that are opinionated about actor in this uh, example that write something awesome on Twitter, uh, try to find them in real life if possible or call them. Because uh, actually through Twitter we got contact with the insiders in a lot of the pro actor supporting organizations and we could help them uh, well start making some trouble inside their own organizations to try to change things. And uh, it's a really good, uh, you know, way to find people who are doing an active struggle that uh, you can uh, possibly support on the world. Then there's the mass mobilization. Facebook just I mean it aggregated the all the people that were behind us but really didn't participate in the debate. Then there's um, all the, our opponents actually they killed themselves. There was the, the Danish Liberal Party releasing press releases that, that told people basically to, to do the same thing that they were complaining about. Then there's the, the Danish Union of Journalists that are, for some reason, part of the right, what's called the Rights Alliance. It used to be called the Anti-Piracy Movement, uh, or Anti-Pirat anti Um It's like 15,000 unionized journalists that are part of the Anti-Piracy Movement. So they, the, the Rights Alliance tried to push a sheet, it's called Facta on Acta. The facts about Acta saying there's nothing wrong, you, the, nothing is going to change in, in Denmark, it, it, all the activists are wrong, they're just misinformed. They tried to push it through the journalist union. And that made a lot of journalists really, really pissed off because they couldn't cover something that their union was saying. It's not a problem, right? Um, so that just melted down. And we had, I mean, we didn't have anything to do with it. We had just say, okay. Just kill yourself, do it. And then, of course, the, the Rights Alliance themselves also did a really interesting thing. They had a hearing about a completely different thing called the letter writing model, which is the Danish version of three strikes legislation. And in the, the presentation of that, they said, 95% of all content on the internet is illegal. 
So uh, another Danish media um, picked up on that and said it's, it's a Danish fact-checking program called Detector. They look at numbers and say, is there any, does it actually make sense? So they actually made a, made a television program about this number, the 90, 95%. Because uh, when the Danish trade minister was in parliament defending access, she actually pulled this number out of you know, her, you know, and uh, said, that was an argument for access. So they were saying, okay, we have politicians basically just lying. And she had to apologize on public television. Okay, that was just a number. I don't know where it came from. Of course it came from the rights law. And so, on. so they did a lot to, to um, discredit themselves without our help. Um, yeah, there was a demonstration in Berlin on November, or actually all over Europe on um, February the 11th. But we actually didn't participate in that because we had our de demonstration on February the 25th. But just the fact that we had a huge thing going on there actually um, uh, catalyzed a lot of other demonstrations in, in the rest of Europe. So uh, like this is, all these dots are Facebook events, um, how many people are attending them. And uh, that this, I mean, of course, Berlin had the biggest one on the 11th, but ours was you know, on the 25th. So <laughs> this was how it looked on, on the, the 25th from the, from the demo wagon, and I got to make a speech, and it was awesome. Um, the police say that we were 7,000 people. I say we were at least over 9,000, right? There was, yeah, it was good fun, actually. Yeah, and something that was really interesting about the exit demonstration in Denmark was that uh, the youth in Denmark are not that political, actually. But uh, there were thousands of thousands of young people with uh, the meme posters participating in the demonstration. And uh, when you look at demonstrations in Copenhagen in particular, it's usually kind of the same leftist groups that drag themselves through the same demonstration again and again, and you pretty much know who they are. And this was just, wow, the internet is here, who are those people? And it was so awesome to experience that. Uh, uh, apparently this is a, a, a huge uh, issue about, uh, well, among especially young people. Um, we're not going to, uh, we're going to, going to skip the whole process up to, um, I mean, there was a lot of other things going on. We, we got to troll Jens Rode, the MEP, once more because we got a lead from the parliament saying that he's trying to soften up uh, uh, opinion within the, uh, the trade, um, the, the trade, the uh, ITRE, I can't remember the, all, the, all the, the, the acronyms, but one of the, the, the working groups had that had to give an opinion about acts of your he, he said yeah maybe we should soften up this 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 wording and so on so we, we actually caught him doing that and he had to he got really pissed with us and so on. Um, in the end we won and that was I think that got to cement the whole I mean for us in Denmark the big bureau brand and of course it's not in any way shape or form are doing like this. I mean it's all the organization especially like Bato that actually made this happen. And of course, the, the Greens in the Parliament and so on. But just do, just setting that agenda in Denmark was was uh, was part of making the Bid Bureau the brand of what is internet politics in the in the, in the DK. Yes, and uh, well, maybe we should take this part quickly because we actually want to see if we can have some time for some input from you guys, but. Uh, Right now we are, uh, have some new things on the agenda. Uh, net neutrality is going to be a big thing in Denmark. Uh, the uh, the telco ISPs want to do what they call service differentiation, which uh, in technical terms is a blocking of the voice over IP protocols. So it's going to be a blast taking that discussion with uh, the member politicians. And, um, yeah, another project of ours is uh, trying to document how Danish ISPs use uh, deep packet inspection technologies and how they use the same appliances as, uh, as uh, oppressive regimes in the Middle East. And uh, we did an article uh, where we outed um, a, a telco called uh, Free in Denmark. I think you have it, Ella, you have it here in Sweden as well, for using deep packet inspection for blocking uh, group chat and popular streaming sites. And um, based on the article we wrote and uh, the discussion about that, the telco uh, 
umbrella organization invited us inside to participate in the net neutrality uh, discussion uh, group. And I think their strategy was uh, basically to have the troublemakers close by instead of uh, us running around doing uh, discrediting stuff that they would only notice too late. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, uh, we've been doing some work on uh, taking the principal discussion about the DNS blocking and uh, data retention, and especially, um, <coughs> actually, the, the, some months ago we had a, a, a actually a really decent discussion about the, the way uh, chart pornography is blocked in Denmark. And it was quite interesting to see that uh, it was possible to have the discussion without people yeah. like became totally crazy and uh, lost any sense of uh, rational argumentation. So uh, we uh, yeah, tried to like um, yeah, take the principal debates about uh, what uh, the bad effects about the uh, blocking instead of actually solving certain crimes are. And uh, yeah, this Wednesday we are hosting a crypto party, not us, but uh, we are participating in it here in Copenhagen. So that's what we're doing here in the short term. And now the problem, I mean, it's, we've been doing all this just basically out of our free time and uh, private money and so on. Um, right, I see a gratuitous spelling mistake right there. <laughs> Okay, so the problem is, of course, we have um, expenses and all the time we spend on all this stuff. So we, we're really thinking about how do we fund something like this in a sustainable way. Then we're talking about, like, okay, what happens? I mean, one guy just had a kid, he just had a baby. Um, so he's, like, sort of out of the loop. But we still need to get going even though we, and if someone of us, if one of us gets a job or get, get kids or some time, like, we need to have a life and so on. Then there's the whole thing that mainstream media have a really short attention span. So they, I mean, in half a year, they won't remember what ACTA was. They won't remember this whole discussion. So how do we actually keep the media machine going about these issues? Um, then there are the priorities in the political system. IT politics in Denmark is like on the lowest uh, level of priorities. In, I mean, you have immigration and you have social policy and all, and then further down than even, I think, uh, yeah, I don't know, like Christmas, uh, at the moment we're discussing whether um, whether the housing organizations should have Christmas trees, like obligatory or not. That's, and below that we have IT politics. Um, I mean, IT, the whole this debate about internet freedom in Denmark has been, it's been a backwater of digital rights and so on. So we're trying to change that. And then there's the whole discussion of like, how do we actually organize? Because there is no formal entity called BPO. We have a... Uh, uh, organization that can collect funds for us that's not called Bitwar, it's called Bitfinance. And then the Bitwar is at the moment just a brand. And we're discussing okay, should it be a company, should it be a non profit, what should we actually create to sustain the organization? So, going from there, we'd like some inputs. What are your experiences doing stuff like this, like working for digital rights? Um, what kind of tools do you use? What connections can you? New ideas and funding models. So if you have, uh, we don't want questions, we want answers. <laughs> of course, you are allowed to ask questions as well, but we want answers. So, uh, uh, have you been involved in the uh, something called the PSI directive, the public sector information? Uh, like uh, public authorities should uh, publish the data that they produce, uh, for example, statistics, uh, mapping data, uh, stuff like that. We have uh, in uh, Sweden, for example, the official uh, weather forecast service sell their information, but the Norwegian weather forecast service uh, give it away. So many Swedes now use the Norwegian website because they cover Swedish weather forecasts just as well. And we have the mapping agency, the, the uh, uh, survey ordinance, um, where uh, I guess most countries are closed, but the Swedish is more closed than Norwegian. Norwegian is really publishing more maps for free, and the Swedish is 
charging money for that, which maybe they should do. Have you looked into any of that? And not directly, but we are, I mean, what happens when you start being publicly um, visible in the media, the, the people working on these kind of things, they start inviting you to their meetings. So in a month, I'm going to a meeting with the Danish Ministry of Environment uh, about like open data and uh, map, mapping data and all that stuff. So we become part of the discussion, but we have, I mean, it's a, not, it's not a project that we've actually been working on. But that, that's one part of this whole, I mean, the media agenda actually, it feeds the, the policy, policy and yeah, um, especially the open data uh, the debate is uh, something that we are not really strong at and it's a huge issue in Denmark and it's really hard to get public data uh, released in a, in a decent way in Denmark. And also we are uh, moving towards uh, a digitalization of uh, all contact with the government and the government entities in Denmark now where it's required to use uh, crappy uh, web communication systems instead of uh, being able to call uh, like uh, yeah, public offices for some form stuff like that, which is a huge issue as well, but not one that it's really hard to get a, like a, a grasp on that debate. Um, but yeah, we are trying to pretty much open, kick the door in and try to make it possible to get heard and then hopefully we are in a, a position where we can draw on some of the common senses that there is in and can well pave the path for some people with expert knowledge. Uh, I have a problem with the side directly. Partly, um, we are implementing it too slowly. But who is going to be the main beneficiary of a really good implementation? And the dream is, of course, it's the activists. The reality is, it's going to be Google. And that really makes me more and more worried about the fact. Because I was on the committee in Sweden discussing this. Um, everyone was thinking of data as, as like, you know, taking a hard drive and taking some data out. And I said, Google is going to come and say, it's open, it's ours, we'll pay for it, the line straight into the database and we'll take everything we want. So I don't think the next fight around open data is necessarily going to be about how do we make it open, but maybe how do we don't make it too open. And yeah, I know you said we're in the you're not doing open data, it's just like this part scares me. No, I think you can talk anyway. Um, on funding models, I don't think I can have a recommended recommendation. I can say how two different organizations I've been involved in have done it. Uh, the Julia Group, which is doing similar work to you back in Sweden, and Telecomics, which is more of a, a swarm. Telecomics had donations for a little while and then decided no money involved whatsoever. Um, people can put servers or other goods to the use of the organization, but just stay away from money because they don't want that formal organization at all. The Julia Group is a formal organization. Um, it's not a non-profit because it's kind of tricky to get that in Sweden, but it's not a formal uh, company anyway. Uh, we do have the ability to take on funds, and the way we've done it so far is have specific projects that we search money for. Um, and that funds that specific project. And the rest of the work we do is, is our free time. But we do it for specific projects, get money for the specific thing. And I wouldn't say it works brilliantly, <laughs> but it kind of works right now. Uh, just a short question. Uh, who gives you the money for the projects? Um, it's we've been applying for grants to do things. So it's not sponsoring, but it's Research grants. Grant. It's been uh, like Sweden. The, right now it's in the internet. What do you call the IIS in Sweden? Sorry. Internet fund, yeah. It, depending on what model that you want to go for in terms of the company or NGO or CSO, um, the Open Society Institute has an open grant year round for think tanks. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go that, and the OSI are really good because what they do is they'll give you core or C funding, which means they will give you, you know, electricity for servers and they will pay the coffee and the rent and they'll pay you because it, it's not very sexy costs and not everyone will want to pay that. They'll pay the sexy, like, yes, we're saving the internets in Syria. 
okay, yeah, we'll pay you that, but only activity costs. So, open um, society. Sorry? Open society. It's open society institutes? Yes. Um, I think it's New York, so the Soros Foundation, uh, but they just rebranded themselves. I think they're called Open Society Institutes now. Yeah. But um, they have an, and they have a couple of these grants that are open year-round, so you don't even, I mean, you can apply for them now if you want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the oh, okay. Well, I want to say two things. One, about um, uh, new ideas that I have, something I've been following the artist debate and been involved in that. And I think just to say, the people you have to pick on is the European Commission, not really the Parliament. The European mm -hmm. Commission is rotten, basically. Mm -hmm. And they are passing every week, there is like a new directive or a new thing they want to sneak in. And now with a, they want to do it you know, totally the other way, which is with a single market thing now. And they're, you know, now starting all this thing about like, oh, we want to reform copyright bot, you know, like that thing of like the bot that is just super half ass and it never happens anything. So I don't know, but it's just like the single market thing now is going to, is where they want to pass all these things. And something, I mean, um, for instance, in Brazil, they're going to, they were going to reform the copyright law last week, like a super good law that like was called Marco Civil. And they basically slash it with uh, the part of um, due process only if it's copyright infringement. So you have to be kind of like aware that like in the single market directive in the EU, uh, EU they can do the same, saying we're going to do this and this and this, but if it's copyright, we are not going to guarantee anything, which is kind of like the trend in all those things. So I just want to say that, like you have to pick one of those guys because they're horrible. <laughs> and the second thing I want to say is that I think it's super good that you're doing this like more open NGO or association because for instance, I follow, I'm very involved with Act for the Bay, but I, I refuse to get involved into an NGO. Mm -hmm. So I'm always trying to plug in what I can do in this or here or there, but I don't want to be in an NGO. You know, I want to have a life and I don't want to, I mean, I've been, for instance, in these super open models like telecomics that like, now turning something horrible. And now, and I've been also involved with NGOs and stuff, and I couldn't be there all the time either because I have a life, I'm interested in this, I follow it, but I don't want to be either too institutionalized or claiming that I save the internet and Syria and stuff. So I think we need more of these things that you can say, we have this problem, this problem, and this problem, and you can just come in, in and out help and do it and go, you know, like just being more resilient and without having to build these monsters of NGOs that need so much funding. And you can still contribute things, you know, maybe without putting money, but human resources, dedicating lots of time because there is genuinely lots of people that is interested. And I don't believe this thing that like youth is not politicized. When it was all the ACTA thing, I saw it, like people just needed, I mean, they are just not interested in the stupid politics. Or like the politics that police tradition have that is just like a, a PR or you know propaganda. This is actually politics that people can can do something. So I think there's lots of people. I mean that I know them. We have I have so much friends. We are lots of people that we really do stuff, but we are not going to get either here in the anonymous thing and that or into the NGO thing because we, we, we want to just do also. <coughs> so I think you should advertise more that you are like an open <laughs> umbrella and stuff, because I mean, that's super needed. So in terms of ideas, it seems like um, in Europe, like there's now enough sort of organizations or movements uh, like yours that it sort of would make sense to possibly have a conference where everyone gets together. But it's interesting because if there's like a yearly conference, it's like wait, it's a lot of work and it kind of can take energy away from the work that organizations are doing. But if it's held either like every two years or perhaps a day um, at CCC camp or something like that, it could be a really good wet, uh, kind of mechanism to get everyone together who is working on similar things but uh, kind of local issues. Um, to kind of keep the momentum going as well, you know, so it's just something to think about because it does seem like the time is right. 
but if it's done on a yearly basis, it often sucks resources away and energy and time from groups that are already strapped for, for time and energy. Have you ever tried to uh, uh, ask for the possibility to get money from, from Chinese-speak cities? For, for what? From Chinese-speak cities. For instance, there's, there was a program running on Shanghai last year that provides uh, the free internet for the public, but uh, because of the short of the experience, the government made a super mess up there. And after that, there are a couple of conferences set up uh, uh, earlier this, this year that's uh, asking for the practical experience from the uh, other companies from abroad. And uh, if you can show your uh, capabilities on those things, I think uh, some big cities, their governments should, uh, are interested in invest your project. I, I think it would actually, it would be nice to have the money, but I think it would be a big problem taking um, Chinese money to fight for a free internet. That and is to, actually a... Uh, branding wise. <laughs> but Europe does the same. I yeah, mean, yeah, all yeah. the governments are the same. I think we should take Chinese money. <laughs> I mean, I mean... I mean it's just, yeah. Especially, you know, how the thing, international issues happened between the Chinese big companies or, or foundation or organizations that always got the support or, uh, or uh, permission from the government, like how the companies that bought the oil a couple of months ago, that they, if, they, if without the supporting from the government, they cannot borrow, well, borrow million money or billion money from the, from the bank. So, I mean, if you got the, got the attention from the government, then you certainly have some, some way to, to go through it. It looks like our time at the, the short break time between sessions is almost up now, so I think we will just uh, run out for now. Um, one of the things that uh, we forgot to mention that we actually learned during ACTA is uh, pretty much some skills in political hacking understood as uh, learning how the Danish parliamentarian system works, the EU system, uh, and understanding the processes and where there is opportunities to uh, uh, kick the evil lobbyist in the vaults. And um, actually, it's some really, really practical skills, and I know the uh, have a really nice guide for, uh, guide for uh, geeks and activists on how to understand the EU system described in float diagrams and uh, state machines and all kind of uh, fantastic uh, yeah, language. And uh, I think that's one of the things that we would really like to do, like get closer to the uh, well machines of uh, policy making and try to see how we can uh, interact with them and uh, make some of the things that we really don't really feel for break. And uh, it would be really interesting to get together with uh, the, some people from other countries than Denmark and. Uh, try to evolve strategies on what to do with the EU because of course we have the same problem that the, the Commission uh, are coming with a lot of crap that we are reacting to when it's a bit too late in Denmark like uh, policies on uh, data retention, um, net neutrality, uh, blocking of uh, different concepts and stuff and it would be really nice to to educate a new generation of political hackers that are really skilled in, uh, in breaking the horrible system of uh, bad internet policies. <laughs>